The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. It felt like something else was in control. It wasn't me. A fortune teller. I would see these spirits and they would talk to me. Who dabbled in the dark arts. I had cauldrons. Animal sacrifices were in there. Watch what spooked her straight. I balled up my fist and I said, I renounce you, Satan, all your works. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. It's the day of witches and goblins and ghouls. And the Republicans have dressed up Nancy Pelosi as the witch of the year. And they are focusing on her. If you vote for one of these guys, you're voting for her as speaker. And she is the one to scare on Halloween. So, I, I don't Only know. on Halloween? Yeah, I don't know if it's going to succeed or not, but that seems to be the tactic. But there's something else that's going on, too. We're, we're having an invasion of people. You know, the folks down in Latin America are not stupid, and they really want to come up to North America. That's where everything, there's prosperity, there's money, there, there's jobs, there are all these nice things. And they dream about coming north to America. So how do you get in? Well, they've got some laws here that they want to take advantage of. They, they say they're, that they can claim asylum because they're being persecuted, and lawyers give them the, the pitch to make. And so there are thousands, thousands jamming the courts to get free. The other thing is, if they get pregnant, they can get across the border uh, and they can have a baby on American soil, then that, that baby becomes an American citizen with all the rights thereof. And how did they do it? It was on account of the 14th Amendment had to do with slaves being citizens. But has anybody ever uh, uh, you know, uh, come across an invasion of this magnitude? Well, the president sort of said, well, I'm going to give an executive order. I'm not going to uh, uh, agree with that. But, of course, the legal scholars are immediately jumping on you and say, no, no, Mr. President, this is the 14th Amendment, and uh, you can't just automatically uh, wipe out the citizenship of somebody born here. Well, what's really got to happen is the Supreme Court right now has got to rule on it. They have had several rulings so far. The child of a Chinese immigrant, for example, who, who didn't have legal citizenship was still an American citizen. So, but what about all these illegals? who are coming across, they don't have status, and are they really on American soil? So what's got to happen is I think the Supreme Court has got to rule on it again, but the president can't do it, and I think everybody realizes he can't do it by executive order, but something's got to be done because it's just one more loophole that is being uh, manipulated by people who want to take advantage of our country. Wendy. Yeah, and Pat, Trump says he wants to close that loophole with an executive order, as you mentioned. But as Dale heard reports, that has sparked a debate over what the amendment says and how it can be changed. Does President Trump have the power to strike a blow to birthright citizenship, which is backed up by the 14th Amendment, with the stroke of his pen? That depends on who you ask. Dr. Bradley Jacob is a constitutional expert at Regent University School of Law. In my view, the president's ability to change the law through executive orders is pretty limited. The question then really becomes, can we treat children of illegal immigrants as being not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States? Constitutional scholars differ on that question. What he's doing is forcing a court battle. Tom Fitton of Judicial Watch says the president's idea is worth considering. I think we just have to be very direct in asking questions as to whether or not birthright citizenship is uh, a bridge too far in terms of benefits to illegal aliens. Even the future Democratic Senate Majority Leader argued in 1993 that no sane country would allow birthright citizenship. If making it easy to be an illegal alien isn't enough, how about offering a reward for being an illegal immigrant? No, no sane country would do that, right? Guess again. President Trump announced his plan on Axios on HBO, which airs November 4th. On immigration, some legal scholars believe you can get rid of birthright citizenship without changing the Constitution. With an executive could, order. Exactly. Right. Uh, have you thought about that? Yes. 
Tell me more. It was always told to me that you needed a constitutional amendment. Right. Guess what? Amendment. You don't. You don't. Number one. Number one, you don't need that. Number two. I mean, that's in dispute. You could definitely that's very much in dispute. Well, you can definitely do it with an act of Congress. But now they're saying I can do it just with an executive order. But the top Republican in Congress said the president does not have that power. Well, you obviously cannot do that. Uh, you cannot end birthright citizenship with an executive order. We didn't like it when Obama tried changing immigration laws via executive action. I think in this case, the 14th Amendment is pretty clear. The backdrop for the president's threat to end birthright citizenship is this. The caravan of illegal migrants approaching the U.S.-Mexico border and a midterm election where addressing illegal immigration has huge appeal for the president's base. I wish I could just tell him, and I say it, caravan. Turn around. You're not coming in. You're not coming in. I'm sorry. And the president is sending more than 5,000 active duty troops to the border to stop it. If the president does spark a court battle over the 14th Amendment, one of the questions for the court is fairly easy. Does a law written to help freed slaves already in the United States apply to illegal foreigners? Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. Uh, you know, something happened in Pakistan young girl was being harassed and they said you don't honor the prophet and and she said did the prophet die for you and my savior died for me that was it and this is pakistan so they they uh, want to try her and execute her on account of blasphemy against the prophet I mean, that's, I mean, I've been to Pakistan, and I've dealt with the Pakistani people, and they were just very wonderful, reasonable people. And all of a sudden, some uh, fanatic Muslims have taken over that country. And the fact that they would execute this poor little girl on account of saying, my Savior died for me, did Muhammad die for you? I mean, there's nothing in the record that indicated Muhammad ever died for anybody. So why is that blasphemy? Well... Christians now are celebrating a religious freedom victory, which I might add was sparked in large measure by the American Center for Law and Justice. They've been working on it. But uh, Christians in Pakistan are now on guard for reprisals on account of that, that uh, uh, holding. I tell you, these fanatic Muslims just go wild. They go wild, and, and, and they get stirred up, and then they, they go on a rampage, and they'll start... Uh, killing Christians and desecrating churches and so forth. Well, John Jessup has more on that story. John? Thanks, Pat. Asiya Bibi, the Pakistani Christian woman sentenced to death for blasphemy, is free today. The country's highest court acquitting her of the charges that brought her a death sentence back in 2010. Pakistan's chief justice announced the verdict to a packed courtroom. The charges against Bibi date back to a hot day in 2009 when she went to get water for her fellow farm workers. Two Muslim women refused a drink from a container used by Bibi, a Christian. Later, a mob accused her of blasphemy. Her family and lawyers say she never insulted the prophet. The landmark ruling could set off mass protests or violence by hardline Islamists. CBN's Gary Lane says the country's Christians could be in danger. We need to be praying as Christians for Christians in Pakistan and the churches there because Islamists are already starting to riot. And if it gets out of hand, they could end up burning uh, churches, uh, hurting Christians and so forth. So we need to be praying. The American Center for Law and Justice has been fighting for Asya Bibi's release in Pakistan and at the United Nations. Well, turning now to the U.S. and midterm elections, now less than one week away. One of the hottest races is in West Virginia, where Democrat Senator Joe Manchin faces a serious challenge by the state's Republican Attorney General. As Jennifer Wishon reports, if the incumbent was any Democrat other than Manchin, the Republican would likely win in a rout. Over the past 20 years, the Mountaineer State has done a political somersault flipping from deep blue to reliably red. Its entire congressional delegation is Republican, except for its senior senator, Democrat Joe Manchin, who's facing a challenge from State Attorney General Patrick Morrissey. He's West Virginia's first Republican AG in nearly 80 years. As a Senate candidate, he's taking full advantage of enthusiasm for President Trump, who won the state with nearly 70% of the vote. Pro-life, pro-gun, pro-cold, pro-Trump. I'm Patrick Morrissey, and I'm your conservative fighter. 
And in this new red state, he's painting his opponent as out of touch. Liberal Joe's got to go. Amen, brothers. Manchin is playing a trump card, too, reminding voters that he chooses West Virginia over party, like his well-timed vote to confirm Justice Kavanaugh. I'm Joe Manchin, and I approve this message because for me, all roads lead to West Virginia. And he's not letting the loss of the NRA's endorsement to Morrissey stop him from showing off his gun rights bona fides. Now the threat is Patrick Morrissey's lawsuit to take away health care from people with pre-existing conditions. He is just dead wrong. Pro-life groups are taking aim at Manchin for his lukewarm support for life. The Senate race coincides with a constitutional amendment that clarifies West Virginia neither secures nor protects the right to abortion. Here at the Romney Diner, voters are quick to share who they're supporting. I'm going to vote for uh, Morrissey. For Gary Seville, it's simple. He's happy with President Trump and wants to send him a solid soldier. That's what I want to say. Okay. Somebody will support him. Quite frankly, Joe's the guy that needs to be in Washington. Nicholson appreciates Manchin's willingness to cross the aisle and vote with Republicans. Vote with your heart, not with your party. You've got to go on your own gut belief and your research to make a decision. And yes, more people need to go across the aisle. There's no doubt about it. Bill McDonald supported Manchin in the past, but he's voting for Morrissey. Look no farther than President Obama's energy policies, he says, to understand why so many West Virginians have switched parties. We're proud, and we will not allow people to take close our coal mines and to intimidate us with opioids, okay, and take away our livelihood, and then they want to continue doing that, and they don't ever want to stop, they want to give up because of clean energy. Morrissey took Obama's clean energy plan to the Supreme Court and won. Donna Hawk voted early, and for her, the answer was easy. Mansion. But she says the real solution to the problems here and the nation don't require an election. We need to get back to God. They took God out of schools, kids went haywire, you know. And it's, we need that spiritual base. The spiritual base is the only thing that can fight the evilness. If Manchin wins, he'll remain a sought after swing vote. If Morrissey pulls off a victory, it will be huge for West Virginia Republicans and President Trump. Reporting from the windy mountains of West Virginia, Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, for more on the midterms, let's go back to Pat. Well, I'm a fan of Joe Manchin. He's a terrific guy, but I, I don't know what's happening over there. You know, the uh, guy who ran for governor ran as a Democrat, then he he got in office and he switched parties, became a Republican. I, I think that Manchin should have walked across the aisle some time ago and he would have been welcomed uh, warmly by the Republicans. It's a close race. It's interesting, though, that, um, you know, he, he's, I, I don't know what to say, except that West Virginia was certainly strongly for Trump and it's a strongly conservative state. Well, our political analyst, John Wagge, is back again. And this time, we look at the all-important battle for the House of Representatives. And John, you're one of the few people who think the House is still in play. Everybody has said, oh, we write off the House as a blue wave. The blue wave is getting broken up on the rocks of something or other. Tell us about your feeling. I my feeling is, uh, I think Jennifer's story reflected it as far as the Senate race. Uh, the, the, the people at the grassroots level seem to have more sense than uh, all the collective punditry that goes on in Washington, D.C. and New York. Uh, it's, it's, we have to get back to God. You know, that's what yeah. the woman said in Jennifer's story. I, I, I think uh, that, that in spite of the numbers, the generic ballot is overwhelmingly in favor of Democrats for the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. But the generic ballot does not decide yeah. who keeps control of the House of Representatives. And so uh, I, I think, for one thing, there, there hasn't been the turning that needs to happen uh, before Election Day, but there are still six days left, five days left. People are voting even as we speak. But uh, I, I think that the, the collective wisdom of the media establishment in Washington and New York was wrong in 2016. I'm not convinced they're right this time, but they certainly have the numbers on their side right now concerning well, the House. Have you identified certain, uh, for example, uh, we live here in the 2nd Congressional District, uh, which is Virginia Beach, 
And <clears throat> they have poured more money into that race than has ever happened in history. And uh, I talked last night to Scott Taylor, who is the incumbent Republican, and he indicated that initial, uh, they, they've got some initial balloting, you know, that usually the Democrats are way ahead. And he said, this time it, it, it isn't showing up that way, that people are getting votes and it looks like it's about even, which would make the, Demo the Republicans come out really well. What do you think? Are there any key districts, as you've uh, pointed out, that might be in play that you want to talk about? Well, we're, uh, specifically, not there. We've chosen ten key right. districts, but they're they're not necessarily going to tell us the story. But these are districts that nine of them are Republican uh, held seats, either open seats vacated by somebody who resigned, or Republican incumbents struggling. Uh, against the Democrats. Talk about and, a couple of them. Who, 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 uh, well, for instance, the the uh, third district in uh, Kentucky, All right. uh, where Andy Barr is facing uh, a Democrat, Amy McGrath, and uh, in in that race, uh, you know, he's he's from the Lexington area, which yeah. would generally be a red district, but he's been in some trouble. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Scott Taylor, and right here in in Virginia Beach, uh, the I, I've been struck by the flurry of negative advertising advertising that we've seen and, and the, the Democrats have poured a lot of money around the country into them. Uh, Dana Rohrabacher, for instance, in California's 48th district. This is a guy who's been in Congress for what, close to yeah, 30 years? He was a strong speech writer, a strong conservative. And, um, uh, he's, and he's being challenged by a former Republican in Orange County. And, and he has a narrow lead. But that's one of the things, one of the bugaboos about this this year and this election is that I'm not sure we can trust the polls. And I know that, you know, you always fall back on, well, the polls are wrong. But in this case, I think they might really be wrong. And I don't think they me are properly measuring the intensity of support for President Trump. And even though he's not on the ballot, he he is, he has put himself in the middle on the ballot. And if we looked at the news cycle over the last four weeks, it's just been incredible. I mean, they've thrown everything but the kitchen sink at him. Yeah. And now he's made his own decision to go on the immigration, uh, the, you know, the, yeah. the, the executive order, which which Dale reported on. And and even though that was his decision, he might, he might there might be a method to his well, madness. He's going on an unprecedented 22 times, which is, no president has ever campaigned like he had. I mean, he's really gone yeah. out there. He has gone all out. And we the lesson of 2016 is that money doesn't necessarily turn out to Sure. to be the predictor. But there, there is a, a, a big uphill climb in each of these individual 435 races well, for the House. Well, there's race that seems to be uh, determinative of uh, the 7th District up in, 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 in uh, Richmond. There's a guy named Brett. That they, they beat Eric Cantor. Yes. Uh, and Brett took over as a Republican. Ha have you got any word on that one? Uh, you know, the polls show uh, either a slight one or two point lead for the Democrat, which would be in the margin of error or, or a slight lead for Brat. But it's going to be close. And again, this is another one of those situations where turnout is going to be everything. You know, talk about the numbers. How many how many seats are held by Republicans that are in play? And, and, and how many do the Democrats have to win in order to take over? OK, the Democrats need 23 seats to take right. over the House of Representatives. There's 235 Republicans now, seven vacancies and 193 Democrats. So they, they need 23. And the most of the polling show, by people who are following it race by race show that the Democrats have enough to win the House at this point. But these races aren't over. There's still several days left, and we don't we don't know who. Well, you mentioned another one in up. California. There's a guy named Duncan Hunter, who's the son of the former right congressman. Narrow narrow lead in California right now. Well, his, two two to three point lead. Two, he's ahead by two. He's three. ahead by two to three points. But these ones where they're behind by two or three points, or ahead by two or three points, well, those he, can literally go either way. We, we mentioned Michigan and having to do with. Uh, the uh, Republican James is coming up so dramatically in Michigan and, and other uh, lesser offices the same way. Yeah, the, the state office uh, for governor is, is showing the Democrat ahead, but the Republican had surged. Um, it, it's it, it, another thing, Pat, that that I should mention concerning the House races, because I think it could be important on election night, and that is that uh, a poll taken, uh, it was an article in Vox uh, back in July, and senior Americans were 
absolutely committed by much higher numbers than millennials. And we know the standard mm -hmm. thinking is that millennials, you know, talk Democrat, but then they don't go to the polls. Now, yeah. it, that we have seen around the country a, a surge in young voters. Uh, there, there's definitely been a surge in Democratic turnout in the primaries and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But the, the senior citizens I'm talking to, if they could vote twice, they would. I mean, and, and I think part of that is that there's kind of a laissez-faire attitude among younger voters about socialism. And older voters remember the Cold War. They know what socialism has done to societies. Yeah. They saw the wall fall. And I, I think that they're just, they're, they're alarmed not only by the, um, uh, just the, the, the media barrage against Trump, but also about uh, the whole uh, business of outright socialists campaigning as Democrats now. And I, and I think that's going to have an effect uh, by the time we get to Tuesday. They talk about health care. Uh, I'm not sure how that becomes a Democrat issue because it was Obamacare everybody hated. And one vote uh, kept the Republicans from turning it over. And now they're owning this lousy health care system. What, what is and it? And I, I think the machinations that went on in Washington, people don't follow that. What, what they are is they're scared and they're, and they're vulnerable to the Democratic attacks that say these people uh, voted not to have pre-existing conditions covered under insurance policies. And people go, well, I better vote Democrat or I'm going to lose whatever health care I can get. I think that's the general theme. And, and it's really hard for Republicans to argue, look, why I, I took this procedural vote because we were planning to repeal and replace Obamacare. Yeah. We didn't get to the replace because of all the Democrats and a couple renegade Republicans. And that's a hard message to get through when you're in town halls where people are are talking about their terrible experience they had with their uh, brother who had cancer, you know? Well, I, I, I noticed that they're going against Pelosi, too. I mean, it's like she becomes the, the poster child of the attack ads. Yeah, and she was on Colbert last night uh, saying that we will win the House of Representatives, and Colbert accused her of jinxing the Democrats. Oh, yeah. said, You're not on Hillary's fireworks barge, are yeah. you? You know, so uh, you know, but they they feel that confident about it. But we'll see. I'm not. I'm not. Right, uh, you want to make a that. prediction of, of how many votes it'll be when it's all over? With? I'll do the how many votes on Monday, but I, I I still say Republicans keep the House. You do say they, they keep. I, the, I think Republicans are going to keep the House, and right. I and I'll add seats in the Senate. That's well. You, you thought there would be what four to five Republican added seats in the Senate? Is that yeah? And that, and that doesn't look good on polls right now. It looks more like two, but uh, I still think that there's going to be this this uh, pocket of voters that is somehow being missed in the polling that's going to up that number. Uh, we'll see. Uh, uh, they, how about that race in, in Arizona, that McSally thing? I mean, she, I just can't understand why she wouldn't be way, way ahead. Well, uh, you know, there, there are some angry Arizonans over their Republican senators uh, previously. Uh, and a lot of young and independent voters are excited about cinema in spite of the, the uh, quotes that she's famous for, calling Arizona the meth lab of democracy. That uh, doesn't seem to offend too many young people and in independents. It would be okay to go join but, the Taliban. I mean, that yeah. was a happy I, I still think that McSally is, is going to come through in the end, there, there was a six-point lead for cinema in one of the latest polls. But if you factor in the Green Party, who is on the ballot, it go, goes down to three points. It's it's within margins of error there. There, 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 there are co close Senate races all over the map. Yeah. And the bottom line remains, Republicans have to defend four, and there are about 10 that Democrats have to have to defend. And so the numbers are in the Republicans' favor. We'll see how it works. So you're going to come back and give us a, a more precise uh, analysis? I'll, gi I'll give specific numbers on Monday. Day. The on day Monday, before election Monday. day. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll hold our breath. But right now, your your forecast is Republicans hold the House and hold and, and gain in the Senate. Yes. Well, we'll yes. see what happens. So listen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here, and we'll see what happens. You can watch, of course, live election night coverage on our CBN News channel. To find the channel in your area, go to CBN News website. Our election coverage will also air on Freeform at 11 p.m. All right, Wendy, what you got next? All right, Pat, John's making us wait. We'll just have to wait then. All right, well, up next, a fortune teller and medium who thought her gift was from God.
I would see these spirits and they look like, like people, but they're transparent. And they would talk to me and tell me about the person. I thought I was working for Jesus and I thought I was helping people. See what put this medium out of business after this. Well, you're welcome to the 700 Club. I'm so glad to have all of you with us. We've got some wonderful things coming up, so stay with us. This one is kind of spooky, but at work, a lady named Mara Lance was an account executive. After hours, Mara was a practicing medium with a demonic altar in her home that included a cauldron for animal sacrifices. Mara actually thought she was helping people by communing with spirits on their behalf until the day something literally flew off her eyes and those eyes were opened to the truth. At 28 years old, Mara Lands was a wife, a mother, and an account executive at a radio station in Tampa, Florida. She was also a medium for those seeking insight from the spirits. Well, different people that I met I would see these spirits and they look like like people, but they're transparent. And they would talk to me and tell me about the person and about their home life. Mara first heard spirits speaking to her at 13 while using a Ouija board with friends. But she believes it started before she was even born. In Cuba, my grandmother was a very renowned spiritist medium. When my mother was pregnant with me, she prayed over my mother's stomach. We would pray to the different saints. At 15, the lady that was babysitting me, she was involved in the occult. The lady my mom took me at 18 was involved in Santeria. I'm saying, okay, this is the way it is. I guess if you believe in God, this is what believing in God is. As she delved deeper into spiritism, she was convinced her gift was from God. I thought I was working for Jesus and I thought I was helping people. Even the altar she built when she was an adult had Catholic symbols. It was um, like a triangle. I had a brandy sifter with water, a crucifix, and then the Bible opened to Psalms 23. I had cauldrons, animal sacrifices were in there, and I felt a power, but it wasn't a good power. It felt like something else was in control. It wasn't me. Although Mara looked to the spirits for wisdom and direction, her life was in chaos and confusion. By her late 20s, she had divorced, remarried, and was without hope. I was very fearful. I was angry. My husband and I were fighting all the time. I always felt like there was an emptiness, a hole, something missing in my life. I even had thoughts of driving my car into a telephone pole and committing suicide. I'm like, I don't, I'm not happy. There's gotta be something better than this. One day, Mara was filling in for the receptionist at the radio station when an old classmate walked in. He was now a pastor and was there to record a weekly program. He asked Mara if he could pray for her. At first, she gave it little thought. And I said, sure, you can pray for me all you want. And I'm, and I'm just smoking my cigarette. And then the following week, he would come and, and pray for me. I started doubting what I was involved in. Something was changing. And I said, Jesus, if what I'm involved in is of you, show me. A few days later, Mara was with her family and the conversation turned towards the Bible. And I said, I can, you know, I, I can read anything out of the Bible. I can read a Psalm, I can read any little verse but I can never read anything out of the book of Revelations. And my uncle looked me dead in the eye. He said, that's because you're with the devil. And he said, you can't be with God and the devil at the same time. And I got angry. Mara went home determined to read through Revelation. I grabbed the Bible off the altar. I was gonna start to read. The wall behind me started banging like, bah, 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 bah. and I got scared and I started to close up the Bible. But all of a sudden, it's like this presence entered this room, like the, a blanket of peace. The noise stopped instantly. That night, she read the entire book of Revelation. When I read the last word, which was amen, 
literally something flew off my eyes. I had this knowledge, this knowing that Satan had used me and he had deceived me all of my life. And I balled up my fist and I said, I renounce you, Satan, no, it works. The Lord said, now you're gonna work for me. The love that flooded my being was incredible. That missing hole was gone. The next day, she called the pastor that had prayed for her. Together, they tore down the altar in her home. The Holy Spirit just came in in such an awesome way that I asked him to take that vision away. So I didn't see spirits anymore. I asked the Lord and he did, he took it away. As Mara read the Bible, prayed and attended church, she learned to give God control of her life and her husband took notice. He saw such a change in me that get, made him curious. So he started to go to church with me. He got saved eight months later. Today, Mara says she's found peace as she looks to God for guidance. I let Jesus take control of my life. Jesus took my fear. He set me free totally. It was His love that brought me to salvation. His love is everything to me. What a story. Now listen, folks. I want everybody to realize she was in touch with the devil. Those spirits came to her and talked to her. She was under the control of Satan. Now, I've heard people say, well, there's no such thing as Satan. It's merely an absence of, of good. It's just a force of evil. There is a human, I mean a human, but there is a spiritual being known as Satan. He's the enemy of God. He's the rebel against God. He's not naming the Old Testament or New Testament as a pagan. Uh, he is the Lord of the underworld. He's real. And what he wants more than anything else is worship. He wants people to worship him. That's what he asked Jesus Christ to do. He said, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you everything. I've got it because it's all been given to me. Well, of course, he's a liar. He's a, 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 the father of lies. And he will lie and he will deceive and he will destroy. But he is real. And any of you who have been dabbling in the occult, in, in tarot cards or any of this uh, supernatural stuff, uh, if you haven't gotten as far as Mara, I don't know, but if you're engaged in any of that, you need to renounce it. And I'll tell you what to do right now. But first of all, you need to give your heart to Jesus. You need to call on the Lord. And as many as will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't want to be destroyed. The devil has come to kill and to, to destroy. He hasn't come to build up. He hates people made in God's image. And what he wants is worship. And then having got the worship, he then wants to kill you and destroy you. Mara came free. Something flew off her eyes. You want to be free. I want you to pray this with me right now. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are God, and I know that you died for my sins, and that you rose again, that I might live forever. So right now, Lord, I renounce Satan, and I forbid Satan to have any part of me anymore. I am yours. And Satan, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave me and never come back again, for I belong to the Lord. Satan, I bind your power and the forces of evil. In the name of Jesus, I bind you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for hearing my prayer. From this moment on, I am yours. Now, if you prayed with me just then, God has heard your prayer. And I want to give you something. I've got a little booklet called Angels, Demons, and the End Times. It talks about, you know, she was mentioning about the book of Revelation. It talks about what the Lord has to say about demons. And he, the Lord himself, dealt with what he called evil spirits. They were, they were very much present in his ministry. I'll give this to you if you just call in. Say, look, I prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord, and I am free. And if you need further prayer, somebody's here to pray with you. Pick up the telephone and call right now. It's a toll-free number. It won't cost you a thing. 
set yourself free. Do not walk in bondage, but walk in the liberty of the children of God. The Lord has come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He has come to kill and to destroy, which take your pick. You're either going to be with Jesus or you're going to be with the devil. There's no middle ground, folks. Call right now. It's 1-800. It's toll-free number, 700-7000. It's easy to remember. Toll-free, 1-800-700-7000. Wendy. Powerful story. Thanks, Pat. Well, coming up, the incredible story of the running man who knocks out world records at the age of 101. And I won the 800 meters, set a new world record. The mile record, I really slaughtered. I read it in 957. Meet this marathon running globe trotter when we come back. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Pittsburgh's Jewish community faces another day of funerals for the victims of Saturday's synagogue massacre. President Trump and the First Lady visited the city Tuesday. One of their stops included laying white roses and a stone for each of the 11 victims. Nearby protesters shouted that the president was not welcome. Local and religious leaders were divided on Trump's visit. The Philippines is recovering from deadly typhoon U2. The powerful storm blew across the northern Philippines Tuesday, wreaking havoc. It sparked landslides, killing at least six people. The storm also knocked down trees and power posts and ripped roofs off houses and stores. Thousands were also forced to flee from villages that were still recovering from a deadly storm last month. Well, you can always get the latest news from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, over the course of his 101 years on this earth, Orville Rogers has logged countless miles, both on land and high above it. But whether he was pounding the pavement in his shoes or piloting an aircraft across the seas, one thing has remained constant. He's done it for the glory of the Lord. Here's his story. At 101 years young, Orville Rogers still has a spring in his step and shows no signs of slowing down. The former airline pilot still remembers the day he fell in love with flying. I was a young boy, about 10 years old, and Lindbergh circled my schoolhouse, 1927, after his transatlantic solo flight. That cemented my desire to be a pilot. Around that same time, Orville felt another call. He came to faith in Christ and has never looked back. In this little town of Sulphur, Oklahoma, my mother took my sister and me across the street to a Southern Baptist small church. And one Sunday night, I just felt God calling to repent of my sins and trust Him as my Lord and Savior. It's just a decision I have never regretted. Orville received his bachelor's degree from the University of Oklahoma and was enrolled in seminary in 1940 when World War II broke out. I uh, asked him if I could enlist in the Army Air Corps and learn to fly instead of being in the walking army, and they said, sure. So that was God's way of turning me around from what I perceived to be a career in vocational Christian service to one of every bit as important, a layman in God's service doing his work for his glory. That work included a 30-year career as a commercial pilot, as well as flying missionary trips to South America and Africa. In 1965, I met the founder of Wycliffe Bible Translators, William Cameron Townsend, said, I'm an airline pilot. There's no way I can plug into your program. He said, well, we have an airplane in Miami. And then they asked me to fly it to Bogota which was my first ferry flight experience with Wycliffe or Southern Baptist. I eventually ended up ferrying 46 missionary airplanes, 
20 of them inside the United States, 26 of them were in South America or over the Atlantic or Pacific Oceans. And that was quite a challenge to, uh, to fly across an ocean in a single engine airplane. Orville and his wife moved to Dallas where Orville began flying for Braniff Airlines. Most of my flying for Braniff was domestic inside the United States, but the last 15 or 16 months, I flew to South America flying the Stretch DC-8, which at that time was one of the largest airplanes in, in airline service. We had one flight that flew from New York to Buenos Aires, 10 hours and 40 minutes. But at that time, I think we had the longest flight in the airline industry. Along the way, Orville and his wife also began investing in real estate and the oil and gas industries, which enabled them to later support many ministries. My wife and I determined that we had to increase our giving, which we did, and God blessed our investments. In the course of my wife and I, our marriage together, and since her death, she and I have given away over $35 million to God's work. Now to put that in perspective, uh, you need to realize that my total earnings from Braniff and the Air Corps and Air Force were about a million six hundred thousand dollars. So God was able to multiply that, I think because of our faithfulness. One mission trip to Russia in 2004 brought Orville full circle. In 1952, I was flying the B-36, the largest airplane in the world, and our primary retaliatory strike force against Russia, a war had broken out. My target was located just on the north side of Moscow. 52 years later, in 2004, my wife and I were on a missionary team. We docked on the northwest side of Moscow. We had our medical clinics and did street witnessing, all within about five miles of where my target was to drop an atom bomb. Instead of uh, death and destruction from above, we were carrying in God's word, the word of life to the Russian people. He also became a long distance runner after reading several studies on longevity and exercise. Dr. I Min Lee from Brigham and Women's Hospital, she compiled a study. Her conclusion was that people who exercise very vigorously for long periods of time could expect to get back in added lifespan nine hours of added life for every one hour of physical exercise. That is phenomenal. Orville not only ran a number of marathons, he holds two world records in the 90 to 100 age category. I entered two races in Boston, Massachusetts, March the 23rd, 2008, the 800 meter and the one mile run. And three weeks before the race, my wife died. And I talked to my children about it, and we agreed she'd want me to continue to compete, so I did. And I won the 800 meters, set a new world record. The mile record, I really slaughtered. I ran it in 957. Two years ago, Orville wrote his life story in his book, The Running Man. It tells of my experiences in, in life, my flying, my running, my giving, and my family life, and I hope it's a, a benefit and a help to people who may be questioning how they need to serve the Lord better. Orville says his desire has always been to run the race well, as the Apostle Paul encourages us, and to finish well. I never ask God for fame, riches, or long life, and he's given me all three. I don't want to uh, fail my Lord in the last days of my life. I have seen too many people, too many examples of people in public life who failed somehow or other in their later years to keep their high moral standards. That's the primary prayer of my life these days, that I will live well for Jesus as long as he gives me life and breath. Orville Rogers, the running man, and what an inspiration, well, Pat. His mind, I mean, he remembers details of stuff that I, mean, I don't remember. You know, he remembers precisely what happened, you know, in this year, that year, uh, 40 years ago. I mean, he is remarkable. I was just in Rhode Island over the weekend. I met my fiance's 101-year-old aunt. Yeah. Same thing, remembers everything, 
took me to, to where they grew up. The mm -hmm. house is still standing. 101 is, it's the new 80 or so. It I don't really know. It really is. I mean, <laughs> you know, we're all living longer, but I tell you that Orville is something else. Orville, you, you have my my congratulations, brother. It's something you're, you're a, a wonder. Okay. Oh, keep running. All right. Well, still to come, we'll be tackling questions from you, our viewers. Laura says, some of the people I work with don't like me. I work very ha hard. How do I get my coworkers to respect me? Stay tuned for another round of your questions, honest answers with Pat. So don't go away. Welcome back to the 700 Club. It's time for your questions and some honest answers. Let's start with Laura. She says, why don't some of the people I work with like me? A certain few are always trying to get me fired. I've been working in a hospital for a long time and I'm constantly harassed and targeted. I work very hard and do my work well. It seems the more you slack off, the more popular you are. Management seems to be blinded. How can I get people to respect me, like me, stop abusing me? I'm over over 50 and, my, and I mind my own business. I just want to work and go home and not be forced to quit. It's so depressing. What can I do, Pat? Well, I, th I think what you've got to do is to begin to sympathize with other people. I, I don't feel, I feel like you want to be left alone. You've got your own deal and you kind of feel a little bit uh, above some, uh, and, and your coworkers feel that, that you have a sense that you are better than they are, and they resent it. I really believe that's what I'm hearing in that question. Um, try humility and try service. You know, if you serve others, that's the way you get to be a leader. So think of considerate ways. And for every one of your coworkers, think of something nice you can say about them. Boy, that's a beautiful dress you're wearing. You did such a good job in the OR yesterday. I'm so proud of the work that you're doing. See if you can't compliment your coworkers instead of saying, I want to be left alone. Mm. That's why they don't like you is because you, you, you're not likable. <laughs> and, and the way to get likable is to be nice to others. If you're nice to them, they'll be nice to you. Give it a try, anyhow. All right. Amen. That great advice. All yeah. right. KT says, are nightly bad dreams considered spiritual warfare? I have bad dreams almost every night, and I constantly wake up at the same time every night. What can I do to stop this from happening? I'm desperate. Well, I, I think what you need to do is, you know, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. You need to meditate on the Lord. When you go to sleep at night, what are, you, are you watching some uh, detective show? Are you watching some horror movie? Are you reading some book that has got all kinds of uh, evil things in it? Uh, the last few minutes before you go to sleep, if you could just read the Bible or meditate on a psalm, on some of the promises of God, and focus your mind, you know, great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Have peace in your heart. You see, that's the answer. I mean, what else can you do? But if you're focused on that other stuff, I tell you, if you've been watching any of those movies, I mean, those 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 dramas, they all have tragedies. They all have crises. And, and if you get into that and that becomes your thoughts, then you will not have good sleep. All right. All right. James says, Pat said that if you keep looking at porn, you're going to go to hell and that it's better to marry <clears throat> than to burn with lust. The problem is I'm a 48-year-old single male. The church does nothing to help this. They say get married, but what if you have no options to get married? Churches want to get you saved, but they don't care if you're single and hurting. Well, I mean, let's face it. Do you think the church is going to be a, a, a dating Match. agency? <laughs> I mean, you know, it really isn't. I mean, you've got to do it yourself. Look, go to where there are plenty of single women who would just love to get engaged or married to a really fine young man, if that's who you are. And uh, go out, there are places for singles, but don't think, well, the church doesn't help me. Do it yourself. I mean, let's face it, go where you must have co-workers in the business you're in. Aren't there people there that you can get acquainted with? Can you ask one of them out, would you like to go out and have a cup of coffee or have dinner or something? I mean, surely you can do that. Why do you want the church to do that for you? 
I mean, the church is not a dating agency, folks. <laughs> All right. It, it really is not. It really is. No. <laughs> okay. Ask, ask if, you know, I met my fiance because I asked a girlfriend that I go hiking with, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not meeting anyone in yeah. church. Can you fix me up? And she did. She did. And so now you get yeah. married. And, and now I'm getting married. Right. <laughs> so you see, uh, exhibit A. All right. <laughs> Well, that's all the time we've got, folks. We leave you with today's power minute from the Psalms. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. <laughs> Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about oils. I'm going to tell you how you can get restful sleep. I've got the answer, and I'm going to bring you some samples you can look at. And Laurie's going to be with us to give us the medical uh, facts about essential oils, sleep, rest, happiness. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>